Do you want to listen to lectures without having your phone on? Get the One Islam TV app today, available on these platforms. Grateful to Allah Azza wa Jal. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Beloved brothers and sisters, as we had said, the Battle of Tabuk, there were several categories of people that had stayed behind. The first, those who had excuses. The second, those who did not have any excuses. From amongst them were those who were forgiven. And from amongst them were the hypocrites of Medina. And from amongst them were the hypocrites from outside Medina. And as for the hypocrites, they were not really worried about what people thought about them. Because they came with their excuses to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam even before they had gone out to Tabuk, before the army had gone out to Tabuk. But there were three people who were very worried because they had had no excuse. They were not hypocrites and they knew they did not come to present their excuses to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam before they left. The names of these three, the first one, Hilal ibn Umayyah radiyallahu anhu. The second one, Ka'b ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu. And the third one, Murarah ibn Rabi' radiyallahu anhu. May Allah be pleased with all three of them. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam met Ka'b ibn Malik when they came back from Tabuk and asked him, where were you? Why didn't you come with us? So Ka'b ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu, he was a truthful man. He did not have any excuse he says, O oh Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if I were to lie to you to make you happy, you may become happy, but I will be exposed by revelation. And if I were to tell you the truth, perhaps you will be upset with me, meaning I don't have an excuse. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him after he had explained that he had no excuse, that go away from us until Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala clears your names. Allah will decide what exactly was your condition? And the same happened to Hilal ibn Umayyah and the same happened to Murara ibn Rabi'ah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with them. So these three, everyone stopped talking to them. Upon the instruction of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were waiting clarification of the names of these three from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Clarification did not come, not anytime soon. A time came when even the greeting was left. They would actually come in front of the messenger and greet him, Assalamu Alaikum, and he would turn away as per the instruction of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Why did you stay back when it was compulsory, fardu'ain, compulsory upon you to have come out? You left an obligation between you and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And now you want to come and present excuses. And now you want to come and be from amongst those who is saying that, look, I really am sorry. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will clarify your name. The reason here is because there were hypocrites that were admonished and exposed in the Quran. So Allah says, those whom you go back to, who had remained behind, when you get to them, they will present excuses. Do not accept their excuses. Listen to the verses. يَعْتَذِرُونَ إِلَيْكُمْ إِذَا رَجَعْتُمْ إِلَيْهِمْ قُلْ لَا تَعْتَذِرُوا لَنْ نُؤْمِنَ لَكُمْ قَدْ نَبَّأَنَ اللَّهُ مِنْ أَخْبَارِكُمْ They will present excuses when you get back to them as to why they did not come to the expedition of Tabuk. Tell them, we are not going to accept your excuses. Allah has exposed you and Allah has informed us about you. So this is why Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam accepted nobody's excuses. If there was to be an exception, it was only by revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there came a time when these three found it so difficult to exist in Medina Munawwara. They used to come for salah, no one greets them. No one responds their greeting, no one looks at them. And these are companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A day goes by, a week goes by, 10 days go by. 20 days, a month goes by. Then the Prophet ﷺ instructs their wives to separate from them. 
Subhanallah. In the meantime, these people have no hatred in their heart. They are making dua to Allah. Ya Allah, forgive us. Ya Allah, cleanse our name. Ya Allah, clear us. Ya Allah, we ask you forgiveness. Ya Allah, we have wronged. We want you to forgive us. And they continued without losing hope. The wife of Hilal ibn Umayyah. Hilal ibn Umayyah radiallahu anhu was an elderly man. The wife of Hilal ibn Umayyah came to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Rasulallah, my husband is a very old man. Do you allow me to take care of him at least? To take care of him? There is nothing more that I will do besides serve him because he is old. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made the exception for Hilal ibn Umayyah radiallahu anhu. And as for the other two, no exception. There came a time when they were so narrowed, as broad as the earth was, they felt there is nowhere to go. Where can we go? And one day the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes out of his room and he was so happy, so happy. Why was he so happy? Because Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam came to him with verses. وَعَلَى الثَّلَاثَةِ الَّذِينَ خُلِّفُوا حَتَّى إِذَا ضَاقَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَرْضُ بِمَا رَحُبَتْ وَضَاقَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ أَنفُسُهُمْ وَظَنُّوا أَلَّا مَنْ جَاءَ مِنَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا إِلَيْهِ ثُمَّ تَعْبَ عَلَيْهِمْ لِيَتُوبُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ Verses clarifying that these three in particular who had stayed behind from the battle of Tabuk have been forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after what had happened when the earth became so narrow for them, although it was so broad and after their hearts became so hurt and they had engaged in tawbah and so on, Allah says Allah has accepted their tawbah and they are forgiven. So when the companions came, they all began to congratulate these people and embrace them and say, Allah has indeed declared that you people were truthful in that you had no excuse. Your tawbah was truthful. You are not from amongst the hypocrites and Allah has forgiven you. Malik, Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu anhu says, no, I want the messenger to come. And when the messenger came sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and informed him the news, he says, is it from you or is there revelation? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam read the verses. He was so happy, delighted. Now there are verses in the Quran that we read up to the day of Qiyamah. Clarifying the names of certain people from amongst them, these three. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. This was after 50 days of suffering by these three. This was the payment they had to pay. They engaged in tawbah for 50 days. They had to endure the ignoring of all the people including those who were most beloved to them at the top of the list Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam not speaking to them at all because of their sins until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cleansed them and clarified their name may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us also purity and may he make us not from amongst the hypocrites may he clear us and clarify us sometimes you have people who label others sometimes they spread rumor about others they spread rumor about us who will clarify our names besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so in the same way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cleansed the names of those in the past although that was through revelation but it is also Allah through his miracle that can cleanse our names may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from false accusation and more importantly may Allah protect us from messing our tongues falsely accusing others may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really grant us pure tongues Amin. Then when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got back from this battle of Tabuk, this thing had happened and in a few days, a group of people came to meet the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who were they? The people of Thaqif, the people of Ta'if, those who had harmed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more than once. Those whom he had made a dua for before Hijrah, those whom he had made a dua for after Hijrah. After the battle of Hunayn as well, he was asked, O oh Messenger, raise your hands and pray against these people. He says, O oh Allah, guide these people and let them come to me in the condition of Islam. So the same man, Abdi Ali ibn Amr, he comes with a group of six people all together. And he decided, let's go to al Madinah al munawwara As they were coming, al mughira ibn Shu'ba radiallahu anhu sees them. And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu also sees them. 
And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu told Al-Mughira ibn Shu'bah, let me run and inform Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the people of Ta'if are coming, subhanallah. So he went and he told Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was very happy. When they came, he welcomed them. They were his guests, subhanallah. He put up a little tent in the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or according to some narrations, right outside the masjid, in a way that they could hear what happened in the masjid. The Quran, they could hear it. They could see what was happening amongst the believers. They were surprised and amazed. For the first time, they actually lent an ear to what was happening. Up to this time, they did not want to hear. Remember in Ta'if what happened? They did not want to hear anything. They just began to beat this man, Na'udhu Billah. And the Battle of Hunayn, they didn't hear a thing. So they did not really know what Islam was all about. Now they sat and they heard. And after they heard the Prophet Sallallahu after he had obviously one of the most hospitable people in existence, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with his hospitality, they had stayed. And he then speaks to them, enter the fold of Islam. It's about time you came into the fold. So this Abdi Ali ibn Amr, he says, we have a few questions for you. What are the questions? Number one, we have heard you say that adultery is prohibited. What is it with adultery? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, it is totally prohibited and he read the verse Wala zina. Don't even go close to adultery. So this Abdi Ali says, you know, our people, they are involved in it in a big way. If we're going to tell them not to do it, you know, they won't bear patience. They are definitely going to continue engaging in it. And it's very impossible for them to abstain from this that is ingrained in their blood since they were born. He's actually telling the, the messenger that we can't adopt this rule. Then he says, the other one we want to ask you about is riba and interest. What about riba and interest? The Prophet ﷺ recited the verse which explained that that is prohibited. He says, how can we bear patience against that? We have so much dealings full of interest and now you are telling us to cut it completely, totally, instantaneously. It's not going to happen. It's very difficult. And the third question they asked, what about alcohol? This khamr. The wines and the alcohol that we drink. The Prophet ﷺ read the verse again. He said, this is very difficult. Our people are engrossed in it. Buying, selling, drinking, getting drunk. They enjoy it. And this is what they do in their spare time. When they have their wealth, they spend it in this and so on. The Prophet ﷺ said, this is the deen. Not from me. I don't make it on my own. It is a revelation from Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So one of them uttered. They started speaking to one another. They said, you see all these people here, they all used to commit adultery or a lot of them. And a lot of them were involved in interest and a lot of them <coughs> used to drink, but they all left it. So I'm sure we could leave it. Look at the common sense. If they can leave it, why can we not leave it? Look at the sense of these people from Ta'if. How many of us are ready to learn from them that we can leave it if the others have left it. You see others are pure. Why do you have to go to the nightclub? Why do you have to go to drink alcohol? What about the rest of them? Why can't you abstain just like everybody else has abstained? May Allah protect us. Remember Allah gives us chance after chance. We have bad habits. It is lessons like these from the seerah that soften our hearts. And this is when we should be turning to Allah. If the dunya has left interest, why can't we? If they have left adultery, why can't we? If they have left alcohol, why can't we? If they have not gambled, why do we continue gambling? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and may he grant us a turning point. So they decided, okay, we are declaring that you are the messenger of Allah. We have accepted Islam, subhanallah. And we have considered what you have said as prohibited and we will not engage in it. Look at this. Moments ago, they were asking questions and they were promising it's not going to be possible. And a few moments later, they said, if everyone else has done it, we should be doing it as well. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us steadfastness. May he make us from those who look at those who are higher than us in spirituality so that we can move up the ladder. And may he make us from those who look at those who are lower than us in material wealth so that we can appreciate what we have. This is the teaching of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, Unduru ila man huwa dunakum. When it comes to your problems and your difficulties and your material issues, look at those who are in a worse condition. It will make you appreciate the beauty that you are in. Don't ever look at those in a higher material position because then you won't appreciate what you have. You don't have one leg. Look at those who don't have both legs. 
But don't look at those who are running on their feet. Perhaps Allah has tested them with something else. But when it comes to religion, look at those who are higher than you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will assist you to actually go up the ladder when you appreciate those who have achieved, mashallah. You see someone in salah all night, you tell yourself, at least I should read a portion of it. It will protect you from having missed a salah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So these people then went back to their people. But they asked the messenger one more thing. They said, you see, we have a massive idol. Allah was based in their region. He says, Abdi Ali ibn Amr says, for three years, we don't want you to destroy that idol. Leave it because we have women who worship it. We have children. If we destroy it all at once, perhaps they will feel something in their hearts. The Prophet Sallallahu said, no. They said, okay, one year. He said, no. He said, okay, one month. He said, no. It should be destroyed immediately. So they said, okay, can you excuse us from destroying it? You send someone. So he said, no problem, I will send. He sent al Mughira ibn Sha'ba radiallahu anhu. And I want to make mention of a beautiful story that is mentioned in some of the books of history. When I read it, I laughed. So I thought to myself, let me also share it with you. It's mentioned in the books of history that al Mughira ibn Sha'ba radiallahu anhu, he was a companion who was very jocular. He used to like to joke. So the Prophet sallallahu sent him with a few people to destroy Allah. And the people of Thaqif, they all gathered. There's about 10, 15 men with al Mughira ibn Sha'ba come from Medina Munawwara and they have to destroy Allah. He takes the axe and everyone is telling, you know, they have this belief in them. They've been worshipping it since before they were born, meaning their forefathers. And to them, this was their God now going. So they said, this man is going to die as soon as he strikes this idol. He's going to die. Look, he, he cannot hit it. Even though they were people who, who knew what was going on. And they knew what the teachings of Islam were, but they were still under this false notion that this thing here is going to harm the man. So it's reported in one of the narrations that Al-Mughira ibn Sha'ba, he looked at them and he, Allahu Akbar, he struck the idol and he fell down. And when he fell down, they said, you see, we told you. And immediately after he heard them say all their things, he got up and started laughing. And he tells them, what do you think? You think this thing is going to harm me? He says, Subhanallah, Allah is the Khaliq. This is a stone that will never harm or benefit, let alone others, but even itself. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And then he destroyed this entire idol with the help of the others. And this was the end of the shirk in that particular region. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then caused Islam to spread very, very fast because these people were strong. In no time, their people also accepted Islam. What was happening? The groups were coming to Medina Munawwara. Delegations were coming to Medina Munawwara. So much so that the ninth year of Hijrah was known as the year of delegations. In total, there were more than 70 delegations that came to Medina Munawwara. And more than 20 in this particular year. In fact, some of the scholars take it to up, up to 50 delegations in one year until it was known as the year of delegations. What was happening? Delegations were coming one after the other and they were asking questions, accepting Islam. Some of them had accepted Islam and were just coming to declare their pledge. And some of them, they came to learn and they spent some time, some were in large numbers, some delegations made up of only one man. They came, they learned, they went back to their people, they, they told them what happened and the people were accepting Islam. Am Bakrati Abihim, all of them, Afwajan, in armies and in droves, they were accepting Islam, subhanallah. Now, we had made mention yesterday, I'm not going to repeat it, but I just want to highlight the point of the death of the head of the hypocrites in the ninth year of Hijrah. And this was after that Masjid Dirar was destroyed. The hypocrite, the leader, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul had died. And we made mention of it in a little bit of detail yesterday. In the same year, the Prophet sallallahu lost one of his family members again. The previous year, he lost Zainab binti Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa That was in the eighth year of Hijrah. How did she pass away? Do you know the books of history make mention of the fact that when she was making the Hijrah, because Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi'ah, after the battle of Badr, was sent back, if you recall the story, and he was told to send his wife, who was the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa allow her to make Hijrah. As she was leaving, Quraysh began to harm her to the degree that they dropped her from the top of her animal. And she suffered a miscarriage according to some narrations. And she was very ill thereafter. She remained ill until the day she passed away a few years later. 
This was Zainab binti Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She was a woman whose husband being a mushrik still praised her. And he said, if I were to choose from all the women of Quraysh, I still would choose my own wife who I have, the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that was in the eighth year. In the ninth year, he lost another daughter of his, Umm Kulthum, who was married to Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu after the death of Ruqayya binti Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you recall, after the battle of Badr, Ruqayya radiallahu anha passed away. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got another daughter of his married to Uthman. And upon the death of Umm Kulthum, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Oh Uthman, if I had had another daughter, I would have got her married to you. Subhanallah. This is from the virtue of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. What a powerful son-in-law. What a great man. What a great friend. And what a great family member. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us qualities of this nature. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. There was another death that took place in this ninth year. Some narrations say the eighth year of Hijrah. And some of the narrations say the ninth year of Hijrah. This was one day the Prophet ﷺ got up and he told his companions, let's get up and read Salatul Janazah upon a brother of yours who has passed away in Abyssinia. Subhanallah, this was in Najashi. And while he was in Medina Munawwara, the Prophet ﷺ was informed that an Najashi has passed away. So therefore, he instructed his companions to get up and he led Salatul Janazah upon a man who was in Abyssinia because there was no one there to lead Salatul Janazah on him. And here the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam led a salah ala al-ghaib, salah of janazah upon a person who was absent at the time. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told his people that this an-najashi was from amongst those who had died on that particular day. Then also in the ninth year of Hijrah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu for hajj with the Muslims. As the leader of hajj, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu went. One might ask, why did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa not go in the ninth year? He makes mention of some reasons that in Makkah, two things were happening. Two main things were happening that were very negative and very bad. One was they had a habit of promising things. And then if the thing happens, they would then make tawaf around the Kaaba naked, men and women. And sometimes if they wanted something to happen, they would first come around the Kaaba, make tawaf naked, and then they would pray that that thing had happened. They would pray to their idols and so on. So although Makkah was victorious and it was under Muslim hands, there were still people who were not Muslims in Makkah to Mukarramah. And they still used to engage in this type of activity. So the Prophet Wasallam said, I don't want to go there whilst the condition is this. Number two, the Hajj, the rituals of Hajj were slightly different from the rituals we have. They did not used to stop in Arafah. They used to be in Muzdalifa and they treated that as a place of dealing and they used to buy and sell and they made it a festival more than anything else. So the Prophet sallallahu sent Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu with his companions. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu went teaching the people the Islamic teachings of Hajj, exactly how it is supposed to be done. And at the same time, there was an announcement made. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu to meet Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu in order to announce everywhere a few announcements. So why was Ali radiallahu anhu sent? Because when Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu left and he was in Dhul Halaifa, verses were revealed in Medina Munawwara. Bara'atum. مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ إِلَى الَّذِينَ عَاهَدْتُمْ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ Allah has declared freedom from what you have struck as agreement with the mushrikeen. Four months grace after that, everything shall be null and void between us and them. Null and void, which means go and announce to them a few things. One is, no one will make tawaf naked after this time, after this year. No mushrik will make hajj after this year. It's only for the Muslims. Subhanallah. So this was some of the announcements. And the announcement that if there is anything that the Prophet ﷺ has promised you, pledged you here, besides certain agreements that were upheld, the rest of them 
are null and void. It's an Islamic teaching that when you want to declare a treaty or for example, a bilateral agreement, when you want to make it null and void, you must make an announcement, give them some time, a bit of notice. They were given four months notice. And they were told after that, there's nothing between us and you in terms of agreement. Because now, Makkah was no longer in the hands of the Mushriks. Uh, it was now in the hands of the Muslimin. So it came under new leadership and there were new rules and regulations. So uh, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu went for Hajj, mashallah, with a great number of Sahaba radiallahu anhum. They had taken their animals. Uh, they had gone out. He had given lectures on the day of Mina as well as the day of Arafah as well as the day of the slaughter and sacrifice known as the day of Eid or Yawm nahar the day of the sacrifice, as well as the day after that of pelting. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu gave lectures, teaching people, telling them what to do, what not to do. And immediately after that, Ali radiallahu anhu would get up and make announcements of the verses that were revealed and the fact that from next year, nobody's allowed to make tawaf around this Kaaba naked and no mushrik is allowed to make hajj. And with this announcement and with these verses, the entire period of worship of idols in Makkah came to an end. It came to an end. In fact, in a lot of the region, it was already becoming destroyed. People began to understand the reality of idols, that these idols mean nothing. But this Hajj was very important. And then Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu came back to al madinah al munawwara with the companions and mashallah, they had achieved this Hajj. And this was the Hajj where Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa deputed Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu in order to take the Muslimin and to go for Hajj. Introducing the One for Kids TV app. Have peace of mind knowing that all content in the app is carefully crafted to be safe, educational, and in line with Islamic principles. It's an environment where your children can learn, grow, and have fun in a wholesome and enriching way. Download the One for Kids TV app now from the Apple, Google, and Amazon stores today.